Focus is brought to you by Envision Financial, where achieving your goals starts with the right advice and financial tools to help you thrive. Welcome to another episode of Women in Focus. Our Woman in Focus today is a journalist, uh, someone that I have been watching for quite some time in the morning. Um, she was covering for Sonia Sanger uh, for the morning show, and that was ritual in our household. Get up, make your tea, drink tea, watch Need to Talk. That's the woman in focus today, Need to Garcha. Uh, but she has a special announcement that she made a couple of weeks ago. She is our woman in focus today. Let's meet her. Need to, how are you doing? I am doing fantastic. I am so honored to be here with you. Uh, it's a truly uh, incredible opportunity for me to sit down and be face to face with you and getting to share my story. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for agreeing to do that. So a couple of weeks ago, there was an amazing story from you. Uh, earth shattering. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk I about that. I felt like it was earth shattering. <laughs> it was a big deal for me, absolutely. Um, so some of your viewers might recognize that you said my name a little bit differently than the way I have said it on air for years. That's right. I have anglicized my name and pronounced it wrong my whole life. Yes. My name is not Nitu Garcha. Yes. That is a version of my name that I created, I think like a lot of us do in childhood to try and fit in. I didn't even think twice about doing it. I wanted to make it easier for other people People to be yes. able to say a name that was foreign to them and so many millions of people do this yes but I have lived with an inner conflict for a long time and I've made the decision as I recently announced to stop anglicizing my name and pronounce it authentically which is Nitu Garcha Nitu Garcha <laughs> and it just feels so right to be saying it the way my parents, my yes. family, members of the Punjabi community say my name, the way I grew up hearing it, the way it's meant to be said, and now yes. hearing many of my wonderful colleagues who really embrace the challenge of yeah. saying <laughs> sounds that don't exist in the English language, right? Like rolling your R's or the th sound, it's not in the English alphabet. They've really embraced it and hearing them say it correctly yes has made me feel more authentically myself than I ever have in my life. And it's I beautiful. really recognize the power of our platforms, right? As, as people who are public figures in the most intimate settings of people's homes, they're watching us on TV and what we do and how we do it, you are a shining example of this, inspires people, it sets an example and it can influence especially young people. I can't help but think if I saw somebody when I was young, pronouncing their name correctly or authentically on air, maybe I would have been inspired to do the same or at least felt like it's okay to do that and you won't be made fun of for you it. You know, so. children born here of immigrant parents mm -hmm. always go through that turmoil. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, when I first came here, just to add on to your story, mm -hmm. um, people could not say Sushma. I added an H later on. That's a totally different story, numerologically. <laughs> but um, I would sit down and say, okay, you know, uh, when I was born, my parents were so excited because they already had a son. And, and I was born, my mom was so excited and she kept rattling some names. My dad was thinking about a name for me and he said, shush, ma. And she said, that's a lovely name. Let's call her Shushma. Wow. Is that the story <laughs> behind your name? No. That's the story I made up. <laughs> so that, that people could better. say Shushma, right? <laughs> right. Shushma. Okay. Right. Yeah. But you know, children do. My son came up when he was very young and he's, he wanted to change his name. Right. And I had to explain to him that your name has a meaning. Yes, exactly. All the names have a meaning. So yes. once he understood that, he didn't want to change his name. That's beautiful. You know? And that understanding, I think, is really key for a lot of people mm. because those who haven't dealt with this inner conflict about their name and their mm. identity maybe just truly don't understand. There are so many people out there who just think my name is Nitu Garcha. They had no idea that I was saying it wrong. So it's yes. about explaining that there is so much more to it and how deeply rooted it is to but our it, heritage. It's also very interesting that when you are on air uh, and when you say the Punjabi words like Punjab, yes. you don't say Punjab. Yes. You know, you say Punjab, Chandigarh and all those words properly pronounced that gives such a beautiful feeling to people who are listening to it absolutely you know and you are the one who will correct people and say no that's not the way it is this is the way we have to pronounce it so 
I am very happy that you've done that. Thank you so much. And I'm glad you brought that up because that is how this all sparked. I was reporting on the farmers protests in yes. India and pronouncing every other name correctly in my stories. You mentioned Punjab yeah. and Delhi instead yeah. of Punjab and yeah. Delhi. Yeah. And then I get to my sign off at the end of the story and I was like, I can't say Me Too Garcha Global News. I just can't. So I said it authentically. And that really got me thinking. And I had this internal reckoning, I guess you could say, yeah. with myself. And, and here we are. <laughs> Nidhu, I wanted to ask you um, many questions about your profession. Mm -hmm. Why did you want to be a broadcaster? Journalism must be close to your heart. Uh, so I want to take a very short commercial break, come back and ask you all that. So let's take you uh, to a journey back to your childhood. Sounds great. How about that? <laughs> Nitu Garcha is our woman in fo focus today. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Women in Focus. Nitu Garcha is our Nitu Garcha is our Woman in Focus today. I corrected myself. Did, <laughs> did you see that? But you know, you get used to it. You know, when you yeah. say your name in, in in a certain way. But anyway, Nitu, let's take you back to baby Nitu. Where were you born? <laughs> I was born and raised in Penticton wow. in the Okanagan, yes. a beautiful city. And then actually, when I was uh, uh, under one years old, I went to India with my grandmother, my Bibiji, mm. and um, my, both my parents were working. They already had my older sister. Um, it's that immigrant lifestyle where right. you're, you can only juggle so much. Work. There's no support. Uh, both of them were working, mm. uh, my mother, a few weeks after giving birth. So I went to India, and actually, um, this wasn't the plan, but I ended up staying there for a few years. They'd come visit as often as they could, and I came back just in time for kindergarten and started kindergarten knowing not a word of English, my mother tells me that when she picked me up from the airport, when I came back to live in Canada again permanently, I said, why are you driving? Women don't drive. Because at that time, where I was in northern India, it really was not common at all to see no. women driving. And so I grew up in the society where I didn't see that. And so seeing a woman pick me up in the airport, apparently one of the first things I said was, why are you driving? This isn't allowed. Um, and started, you know, kindergarten not knowing very few, if any, words in English. And I had a English as a second language teacher throughout elementary school. And as soon as I nailed that down, I started French immersion. So picked up on quite a few languages at a young age. And um, I, I think I spent my childhood and my upbringing just trying to find myself and where I fit in in a community where there weren't in my school, many who looked like me, I would mm. often be the only Indo-Canadian student in my class and grade Wow! With, among a handful in the whole school. There was another school in Penticton where there were quite a few, but in my school there weren't many, especially not in French immersion. So um, I felt neither here nor there. I very much westernized. Uh, there's this term called whitewashed. I whitewashed myself to fit right. in with my primarily Caucasian friends growing up, but then was so deeply rooted to this culture that I built my psyche in as an infant and a toddler and had gone back to India and learned so much more at age 10 and again in high school. And so wow. I've spent my life kind of feeling like, where, where am I? I'm proud Canadian, grew, growing up in this beautiful community in the Okanagan, but also a Punjabi Sikh. Mm. And um, that balancing act, I think, is what carried me through into a high school. And in my graduating year, I, I obviously was thinking about what I want to do with the rest right. of my life. And I went through everything from wanting to become a commercial pilot. I did take some uh, good <laughs> courses at Southern Skies Aviation in Penticton. Um, I debated uh, nursing. Um, yes. I spent a lot of time in a hospital with my grandmother when she was sick and mm. um, fell in love with the type of selfless work that many nurses do. Mm. Um, I d debated uh, becoming a teacher as well because I love children. I went through everything you can imagine. Journalism was not one of them. Really? Until, yeah, I didn't know. Some people know from a young age that they want to go into journalism. Yeah. I didn't. Um, until I kind of had this epiphany. I, I went through a, a pageant program, actually. I was Miss Penticton in 2008. No kidding. It's, yeah, it's wow. an ambassador program. <laughs> and I was that nervous student who struggled to do class presentations um, in middle school. And, and I kind of found my voice later in life. And then I entered this Miss Penticton program and really found my voice and my platform. And I think that really opened my eyes to how much I wanted to make a difference in my community. Mm. And that paired with me me already being a current events nerd. I would I would watch 
hard news as a child because my dad would have it on all the time and so I I always loved current events I'd get distracted in university right. where I got a business degree um, from my schooling just to focus on what's happening in the world I would always be reading news articles and I, I don't know why it didn't dawn on me that journalism was it for me until um, I started dabbling in TV production in university and got involved in their campus, campus TV program. program and became their first student reporter and producer and then enrolled to BCIT and went to the broadcast journalism program and I went through a, a bit of a, a struggle really understanding what journalism is at first because mm. I had previously been an activist in university. Mm -hmm. I was an elected member of student government and uh -huh. rallying and protesting and engaging in campaigns. I ran a university political action committee and then I had to learn to be completely removed and completely objective right. and get both sides of the story and now I am so deeply firmly planted in that side of the spectrum because that is the most important place for a journalist to be. That is where our power lies, is in telling not just two sides of the story, but all 15 of them. Sometimes there's many, yep. right? Yep. And so um, I've, I've really brought my eclectic experience <laughs> over the course of my upbringing uh, to my career with an aim every day and everything I do, I just think, how am I gonna make an impact today? It's beautiful, I, I was, I, I'm gonna take back take you back when you were in India with your grandma. Yeah. I know of a story of a young woman who, who was like you, um, stayed with her grandmother. So when she came back home, it was very tough for her to be connected with her mother. Yeah. To date, she is in her 50s now. Right. She finds it a little difficult to be very close to her mom. Was that experience difficult for you as well? leaving your grandma and coming oh did your grandma come with you she did come with ah, me yes so that made a difference yes absolutely but i grew up being so so close with my grandmother yeah i said at age 10 in front of my whole class she means more to me than my own life um, I always knew that my life would change when she passed away, which yeah. happened in, in 2017. And ah. sorry, I'm still getting emotional. This was years ago, and um, it, it still deeply impacts me because she meant so much to me and yeah. um, was such a deep part of who I was. I truly felt at age 26 before she passed away, there was nothing more I needed to accomplish in life oh. because I had felt the type of love that I felt for my grandmother. Right. And it's interesting because I'm known as somebody who's so close with my whole family, my siblings, siblings, my parents, but with my connection with my grandmother, my Bibi, was so different. It, it was deeper and at a different level. And to this day, I know that I'm connected to her soul. And um, it's, it's a very special bond. And I love my mother deeply. And, and um, my connection with her is special, but my, gr my connection with my grandmother was something different. So, so would that be your dad's mom or your mom's mom? My dad's mom. That's yes. right. Yes. So you're Bibi. Yes. You know, it, do you find it very interesting that uh, when you were growing up to be able to say Mama Ji or Chacha Ji or Pua <laughs> and other people yeah. who just got uncle and aunt, did you ever explain to people or did you just go with the flow? That is a great question. I remember being in India when I was 10 years old and learning all of those different names for different people in your family for the first time. I was That's like, hey, right. so my dad's younger brother is a Chacha, yes. his older brother is a Thaya. Yes. So when you refer to somebody, you know exactly who they are in the family exactly. lineage. Exactly. That's right. <laughs> it's so interesting. So my, I would often explain to my Caucasian friends, this is why I refer to him as Chacha and him as Thaya or him as Mama because that's my mom's brother, not my dad's brother. So, <laughs> And they would try to wrap their heads around it, bless their hearts, but I'm not sure Forget they ever it. did. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they exactly. would never get it. The naming conventions are uh, helpful. <laughs> <laughs> but they but they do not work. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm going to take another short commercial break, you know, got of course. program paid for, <laughs> and then ask you about your journey in the broadcast industry, landing a job with Global. It's a beautiful company with changed a lot of hands, uh, but you know, it's under good leadership right now. Uh, all the leaders that have been there have been always very nice and, and their time comes and they go and new one comes in. But I want to talk to you about that. So let's okay. take a short break. Sounds good. Neetu Garcha is our Woman in Focus today. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Women in Focus is brought to you by Envision Financial, where achieving your goals starts with the right advice and financial tools to help you thrive.
Welcome back to Women in Focus. Nitu Garcha is our Woman in Focus today. So Nitu, we were talking about you eventually looking at it and saying, okay, I want to be a journalist. And you went through um, BCIT. How, which was your first job? Was global? Actually, I got plucked out of journalism school to start at CKNW Radio, right. which is, of course, under the same umbrella now as Global, under Chorus Entertainment. So yes. I've been with the company since I started my career. Um, it's been my home, and I just firmly planted myself. Interestingly, though, I've covered four maternity leave contracts, <laughs> kind of weaving my way through. So I joke that, you know, beautiful, talented women having babies <laughs> gave birth to my broadcast journalism career. Which is amazing. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes. Yeah. When you were covering for some Sonia, um, elections were happening. Yes. And you were interviewing, morning show is like bang, 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 bang. Yeah. You know, three minutes, maximum four. You know, you can't go beyond that. That's right. So, but the politicians were getting five to seven minutes, I know. Mm -hmm. And you asked a question and Horgan was, you know, he must be thinking, I have to, I haven't talked about that. So he was going round and round. You interrupted him and you said you didn't answer my question. I thought to myself, that was just amazing. <laughs> how were you feeling when you were, when, were you getting uptight about that? Well, I, this is how I've approached interviews um, since I've been given opportunities to do big interviews with people in positions of power because, um, like I mentioned, my goal in this industry is to make an impact and the growing number of communications professional and the sh sadly shrinking number of journalists mm. and how the business model for journalism is unfortunately becoming increasingly unsustainable has me really feeling um, like our jobs are more important now than they ever have been. Mm. And so our job is to hold people in power to account. Yes. And how many times do you see a news conference where you hear the same talking points repeated over and over and over again? So yeah. our opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one with somebody in a position of power, whether it's a CEO or a politician in the midst of an election campaign, as uh, Premier John Horgan was at that time uh, in that interview you referred to, uh, I really think it's on us to mm. make Make a point of, you know, and this is our an platform, yeah. and you're here to answer our questions, not yeah. dictate the narrative. So when I asked what his advice was to voters who we had heard from, who were feeling like there are candidates I've never heard of, I really want to make an informed decision here, but my life has fallen apart during this pandemic, and now we're in an election campaign. So mm. I asked him what his advice is to those people who are now wondering how they make an informed decision mm. in the midst of an election campaign, which didn't need to happen, which he chose to call by breaking the confidence and supply agreement, of course, right. as we know. We all know. And yeah. so he started to repeat talking points that we had already heard multiple times over the last 10 days. And I jumped in and said, I apologize for interrupting, mm. but the question was, what's your advice to these people? And, um, you know, that that generated quite the response. Yes. I'm not sure why, because it was just me doing my job. And at, like at many of my colleagues do, this is just how we approach interviews, right? We, right. we grow people and, and we hold them to account. That's the way you do it. And mm. I will continue doing it that way even though some of the feedback unfortunately is that I come off aggressive or rude when I know that it's not the case it's just no. me doing doing my job your job that's yeah. right and it's very important for people to understand that as a broadcaster you you have to be impartial yes and you have to look at the topic that you're talking about and talk about that Absolutely. and nothing else yeah you know you can mix other things into it but you know stay on the path right yes exactly so what now that you are reporting? Yes. Neetu Garcha is now reporting. <laughs> <laughs> you've, you've covered many different stories. In the last mm, less than a month, which is the one that has been most powerful? Oh, that's a great question. I just recently reported on a very tragic and, and difficult story that um, has stuck with me and many of our viewers, I think. Um, there was a report done by an organization called One Voice Canada about how there's reportedly been a spike in deaths by suicide cases among international students. And I had the opportunity to speak to some international students who came to Canada from India alone without their families. Um, and they opened up about how they came close last year during the pandemic to ending their own lives. Wow. And they so bravely talked about how they got themselves out of that. And there's so much that was involved in their experience, but the number one takeaway is that they talked to somebody. Mm. There was one student who said he wrote a list of 30 names on a piece of paper and made a point to call one person on that list each day and cross the name off because he wanted a fresh perspective each time. And he, he felt like he might be burdening others, mm. which he, he knew he wasn't. 
wasn't, but he personally had that internal guilt as well. So for him, that's what worked for him. Somebody else reached out to the crisis line. Um, but there is this anecdotal evidence yes. of a reported increase in death by suicide cases among international students during the pandemic, especially. They initially weren't eligible for some of the immediate government relief, which um, of course skyrocketed the problem, but as mm. did the shutdown in travel, right. um, isolation, uh, making young women especially vulnerable to sexual ha harassment cases right. as well, and employers um, taking advantage of these students who are desperate to get their permanent residency and uh, have to work a certain amount of hours and get reference letters in order to be able to do so. So they'll they'll do what they need to, and um, of course being misguided by some consultants along the way as well. So it's oh. a very layered issue, of course, but that story is, um, I'll be following up for sure. There's a lot more to unpack. Uh, that, that would be something that would be so good if you could do that mm -hmm. because majority of the young people that come here I find are so burdened mm -hmm. because they don't want to burden their families mm -hmm. so they burden themselves That's right. to not only study but also live here. Yes. So how do you do that? They, I know of some people who are working in warehouses mm -hmm. where they are supposed to get paid close to about 18 to 20 dollars but the people who are getting them to work there is are giving them eight dollars an wow. hour so wow so the ten dollar is being yeah. kept by that that is criminal criminal it is and unfortunately there isn't a lot of evidence to back up the number of instances where that is happening, but within the Indo-Canadian community especially, it seems to be well known that that sort of thing happens. It does. Um, so there's calls for more research to be done and an investigation and inquiry and for there to be accountability, but part of the problem too is, is cultural. Yeah. Um, in many communities uh, where these international students um, come from, mental health is not an issue that's taken seriously. Yes. And they have this cultural pressure to just suck it up and deal with it and yeah. make the family proud. You can't come back to India unless you get your permanent residency, right. but there's a lot that goes into that. And so it's a cultural issue as I'm well. I'm glad that you're looking into that, Nitu. Mm -hmm. There's so many other questions that I want to ask you, but our time is up. <laughs> we ran the <laughs> clock out. <laughs> <laughs> that's Who would have thought? We've, we've done it. Uh, but I want to do another interview with you, if that is possible. Um, so would I you? would be honored to, absolutely. All this right. conversation is to be continued. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure, uh, and I, I look forward to the next time we'll do this. Lovely. Nitu Garcha has been our woman in focus today. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Those who've been stuck for multiple hours to those who are trying to drive by some incredible scenes playing out on this roadway that is flooded in waters that for me are knee deep. But if you think this seems bad, those who work nearby say they've seen worse even during the storm two days ago. Women in Focus is brought to you by Envision Financial, where achieving your goals starts with the right advice and financial tools to help you thrive.